Difference of squares and perfect squares trinomials today. So difference of squares, we're going to talk about that one first. And from a previous lesson, we had something called the sum and difference, product of a sum and difference, where we did something like this. And you had to expand and simplify. And when you expand this, you can see you would get 4x squared. And then you would have minus 2x plus 2x and then minus 1. So this is what we call a difference of squares. How do you know if it's a difference of squares? Well the first thing is that you can take the square root of each term on either side of this minus sign. So this is difference, right? And so this, can I take the square root of 1? Can I take the square root of 4x squared? And I tell my students it's probably a good idea to write those numbers up above. And then you would factor it simply by saying 2x plus 1, 2x minus 1. So you add and subtract um, the second term from the first one. So that's all you have to do to find a difference of squares. Let's try a couple of more. And I'm also going to talk about one other thing you should watch out for. So let's say I had this one. 9x squared minus 49. So you have to recognize what you should be doing with these, right? So if you had, um, if you had a, a simple trinomial or a complex trinomial where the coefficient is greater than 1, or if you have a minus sign, this is what you're looking for here. So this, you have to be able to recognize the different types of factoring skills that you're going to need to use. So again, what you're looking for here is can I take the square root, that's where you're going to start, can I take the square root of each of these numbers? So square root of 49 is 7 and the square root of 9x squared is 3x and there is a minus sign in between. So that means that this is a difference of squares and all I have to do is write 3x, add the 7 and 3x and subtract the 7. And again, just like in the other examples, you can expand and get back to this. So that's how you can check your answer. Homework questions. Um, this is from Math Power, which I'll give Math Power 10. I will give the link again. And this is the page, the page numbers that there are homework questions that uh, reflect either difference of squares or perfect square trinomials. Okay, so sometimes a teacher will try to fool you. Can you imagine that? And maybe your teacher would give you something like this. 18x squared minus 98. And you would say, oh, is it a difference of squares? No, I can't take the square root of 98. And I can't take the square root of 18. So, no. But what is the very first thing you have to remember when you're doing any factoring? I hope you're all yelling out common factor, Miss Herod. That was just a lesson we had just previously. So you can see that once you take out a common factor of two, you're back to this question. So that was an easy one for me to do for you because I already knew um, what the answer would be. Okay, so that's what you're looking for. If you see a minus sign, make sure you do your common factoring first and then it's very simple. Sometimes these kind of questions, they're not perfect squares, but they, they can have, um, you know, a common factor. Let's do one like that. Let's say I had um, uh, 5x squared minus 25. And you'd say, okay, well, there's a minus sign. I can take the square root of this one, but the square root of 5 is not a pretty number. So can I take out a common factor? And yes, so this, this is only a common factor. So common. Okay, let's try another one. 81x squared minus 121. Okay, so here you'd say, okay, 121, the square root of that is 11, and the square root of 81x squared is 9x, and there is a minus sign there, so that's perfect. All I have to do is write 9x, add 11 to it, and 9x, and subtract 11. Okay, so it's important that you see that... Um, First check to see if they're perfect squares, and then always check for that common factor. 
So let's try another one a little more complicated. Let's say I had 3x cubed minus 48x. So when you look at that, you don't see any perfect squares at all. In fact, there's a cube in here, power of 3. But what is the greatest common factor here? What can I take out of both of these numbers? In a number, first of all, would be 3. 3 goes into 48 16 times. And they both have 1x that I can take from them. So that leaves me with x squared minus 16. Aha. Okay, now is this a difference of squares? Yes, it is. What is the square root of 16? 4. What is the square root of x squared? x. So now I'm going to write this out like this. So I have 3x and I have x plus 4 times x minus 4. And there is your complete factoring of this expression. Okay, what about this one? x to the fourth minus 16. What is the square root of x to the fourth? Do you know what that would be? It's just x squared, right? Because when I do x squared times x squared, like this, I would get x to the fourth, right? So the square root of x to the fourth is x squared, and the square root of 16 is 4. So that's going to leave me with this. I'm going to have x squared plus 4 times x squared minus 4. Then you need to look and see, can I factor this any further than what I've done already. And you should recognize that this little tiny one here, this is also a difference of squares because the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of x is x. So in the end, I'm going to have x squared plus 4 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. So you have to go that far in order to completely factor it. Always check to see if there's another difference of squares, especially if you start with the fourth degree. What you should know, and that is that this, you cannot factor a sum of squares. Okay, students try to do that sometimes. A sum of squares. It has to be a difference. Oh, sum of, I'm talking and writing at the same time big challenge for me today. You cannot factor a sum of squares. It has to be a difference. Okay, so look for that minus sign. Now in grade 12, you'll do sum of cubes and difference of cubes, but you don't have to worry about that. Not yet. Okay, and the last um, difference of squares question I want to do for you is one that looks like this. So this would probably be as hard as it's going to get for you at this point in your mathematical career. Okay, 16 minus y minus 3 squared. So I know I can take the square root of this because the whole thing is squared. So the square root of that would just be y minus 3. And the square root of 16, of course, is 4. So that gives me 4. Now you have to be careful here. Um, the plus is okay, but I would put it in like this first in brackets. So I have 4 plus this, and then I have 4 minus this. And it's really important that you have the bracket when you have a minus sign because as you know that's going to change the sign of the terms in the bracket. So this one is easy. I have 4 plus y minus 3. So 4 minus 3 is 1. So I have y plus 1 here. y plus 1. And in this bracket I would have 4 minus y minus y plus seven, uh, plus three, I'm getting ahead of myself, which is seven. So I can either write that as minus y plus seven, or I could write it as seven minus y, right? This doesn't matter what order you put them in. Okay, so that's probably the trickiest one there. Okay, let's go on to the perfect square trinomials. That's gonna be the last factoring method that we're going to learn um, in Great 10, and then we're going to get into quadratics where you're going to use all your factoring skills. So if I had 2x minus 3 and I squared it, now remember the little lesson I taught you on squaring binomials where you say square 
twice the product squared, right? So this is 4x squared, twice the product is minus 6 times 2, minus 12x plus 9. Okay, so this is an expanded perfect square trinomial. So this is a perfect square trinomial, which comes from the expansion of this binomial, I should have said. Okay, so when I look at this and I'm trying to factor it, you could use product sum, right? You could say, oh, the product is 36, product of 36 and a sum of minus 12. And you'd say, um, what times itself gives me 36 and the same two numbers added to give me negative 12. The product is positive. The numbers must both be negative and they just happen to be minus six, minus six. Okay, so they're the very same numbers. So now remember for a complex trinomial, I make two fractions with the first on the bottom. That's a four. I reduce, so it gives me minus three over two and this one gives me minus three over two. And I have the X down here, the other on top. So I end up with two X minus three, two X minus three times two X minus three, which is two X minus three squared. Okay, so how do I know if it's a perfect square trinomial by looking at it? I mean, I know that this was a perfect square trinomial because I expanded this to get it. But let's say I asked you to factor, and that's usually what a question would say. It's going to say factor. It's not going to tell you it's a perfect square trinomial, except maybe in the homework assignment, but on a test they're going to be all mixed up, right? So let's say I had this. And your first clue that it could be a perfect square trinomial would be Oh, I want to know what is the product of 81 and 49. I need two numbers to map, add up to. I don't even know. That's a huge number. Let, let's see what it is, just for fun. 81 times 49. 3,969 product. 3,969 and a sum of 126. Okay, so that's enough to give you a headache. And that's enough to make you say, Ooh, I wonder if this is a perfect square trinomial. So what am I looking for for a perfect square trinomial? Let's look at this backwards. So this number and this number are perfect squares. Can I take the square root of the first and the last term? Yes, what's the square root of 49? The square root of 49 is seven. What is the square root of 81x squared? The square root 81x squared is 9x. Okay, so I have 9x and 7. And remember when we squared this binomial that the middle term was twice the product. So what's the product of 9 and 7 is 63. Twice it is 126. So yes, it is a perfect square trinomial. And then all I have to do is write this out as 9x this sign comes down, so if this was minus, I would just put a minus there, that's all, and squared. So you can double check that, so square this, 81, twice the product, the product is going to be 63 times 2 is 126x, and squared 49. So again, if this number in the middle, if this had been negative, let's do... Um, I don't know if I can make one up in my head that quickly, but let's say it was, uh, let's say uh, 25x squared, and we'll put um, 4 out here, and twice the product, that's going to be 200, right? So let's say minus 200x, so you should be able to make one of these yourself. Okay, so if I look at this, what multiplies to 100 and adds to minus 200. Well, again, I said, okay, well, what is the square root of 4? You'd say 2. What's the square root of 25? And you'd say, let's have it run the wrong question down because this isn't going to work. This should have been 20. Okay, now it's a perfect square. <laughs> oh, dear. That's what happens when you're retired and you're old. 
So 5x times 2 is 10x times 2 is 20x. So ignore that one. So that gives me 5x and 2 squared. But this time, this sign is negative. That's what I was trying to get at. So you want to have a negative in there so that when you square this, you'd have 25x squared twice the product minus 20x squared the last term. Remember, these ones are, this number here is always positive or it's not going to work. And the square root of this number also has to be. Okay, so again, um, there's a little bit of homework on page 167 and 168. There's lots of examples there. And even towards the end of that chapter, if you just scroll through the pages there, there's some really good review. This textbook I find is outstanding for teaching factoring. I've always used it for my classes and they've always been really good factorizers. And you can be too. Bye for now.